So apparently I didn't manage to frighten everybody away. Uh, or, or you just, you like having your minds blown. Uh, thanks to Naresh and, uh, and the team at FunctionalConf for inviting me back. It's the third year I'm here, and uh, I always learn a lot from these events. I find if you just learn one new idea at one of these events, it's, it's generally worth uh, the trip. So if you're still looking for a purple guy for your, your team, I might be the man. I'm no longer the CTO of Dialog, though. Jay Fode, if you were here last year, who accompanied me and gave a uh, talk, um, or gave a workshop last year, is now the CTO. He's a C programmer. I'm originally from the user side, so I used APL for a long time. I managed the development team at Dialog for a while. Now I call myself the CXO, so I'm going out, listening to people's requirements, coming back and translating that into work for the CTO and his team. I have Roger Huey with me here, who's on the implementation team, uh, and also uh, co-author of the J programming language, which you may have heard of, which is similar to APL. He's going to be giving a tutorial uh, this afternoon with more examples of APL. So I'm going to be doing PowerPoints, and I think Roger is going to be live. Right? Yeah, it's not all slides. Anyway, so in John's uh, keynote this morning, he mentioned this uh, Bacchus's talk, his Turing Award acceptance talk. And so that reminded me, this is a slide I used, I think, two years ago in my talk here. Uh, so Bacchus was aware of, uh, of APL back in 77. And he, you know, he pointed out that Iverson was looking for these uh, expressions that are not word at a time, new forms of parallelism. He did go on to mention a number of uh, drawbacks of APL, that at that time it was very procedural. And you could say what Dialog has been working hard on for the last 10 to 15 years is actually trying to remove some of the, th the drawbacks, the deficiencies that Back has found in APL. So a little bit about the background of APL. So I'm going to be talking about notation as a tool for parallel thought, but this talk will also act as an introduction to APL. I think most, how many people saw one of my talks already? Okay, so th that's worthwhile doing. If any of you are able to follow all of this, please talk to me about a job uh, afterwards. It's going to move quite fast when I get going. Okay, so Iverson uh, was a mathematician um, and he was very focused on notation as a tool of thought, so providing language that would make it easier for people to express thoughts, to free their brains from you know, over-complex uh, notations. And uh, I think he quote, these two are quotes from his Turing Award speech uh, two years later. And what Iverson was, was trying to do, he, he learned math a little bit later. He went to university a little bit later than most people. He was in the Air Force first and then only joined the, uh, only went to university a bit later. And he started working on linear algebra. And he was very frustrated by the fact that mathematical notation uses a very wide variety of forms and that the precedence rules and so on are very complicated. And after thinking about that for a while, he set out to to try and organize that and come up with a better language that would uh, allow him to express his thoughts more clearly. So he sort of, he lined all of these up and then he thought about it for a while and he decided, well, AB is gonna be A times B. That's e to the power X, X divided by Y, the B logarithm of A. And he, he wanted to use symbols and you can see here, this is a log seen from the end, right? The tree that's been chopped. Uh, so he used that for logarithm. The a, a to the power reciprocal of n is the nth root of a. Matrix multiplication, he came up with this notation. It's a generalized uh, doing a plus reduction of the multiplication of combinations of rows and columns. FGX, he found that to be good, so he kept it as it was but he chose this as the precedence rule for all of APL. So this is why APL executes from right to left, because that's what mathematics does in this case. And he had to pick one, and he felt that was the, the most general one. The third trigonometric function squared, 
and the sigmas and the pi's are the, the iota six is the index generator, so it generates an array with the numbers from one to six, and then you have either the plus reduction or the multiplication reduction. And then finally, this isn't going to fit on the right-hand side. I need a little bit more space. It looks like this. Um, reading APL, so if we take that slightly complex expression, go back, I'm gonna be cut off from, yeah? Yeah, so this is divided n is the reciprocal of n. So a to the power reciprocal n is the nth root of, so this is just exponentiation, the normal power function. But the argument is the reciprocal of n, which is why it gives you the nth root. Yeah, so there is only one function to do exponentiation. It's just that we're using the reciprocal as the argument, yes? Sorry, it's the, well, you see, that's one of the interesting questions, isn't it? How does this mathematical notation work? Um, I mean, I think it's the tangent, are you saying taking the tangent twice, or is it the tangent squared? I think in mathematical notation, this is taking the tangent and then squaring the result. Or did I get that wrong? Sorry? Right, because the, the three circle x is the third trigonometric function. So that's the tangent of x, and then I'm squaring the result of that. Yeah, but th exactly, I mean, this is what I was saying. Well, this means taking the tangent twice, doesn't it? Tangent of tangent of x. Are you squaring the function, or are you, are you squaring the result of taking the function? And that's what he set out to clean, clean up, in a sense. So reading APL, um, ooh, when I put my head down, it gets very loud. So I would, I would write this as two times A, and here's commute, which Shashi showed us, so divided into minus B, we have here, plus or minus, plus catenated, plus catenate minus, the square root of, so 0.5 um, power commute, and then B squared minus four times A times C. And that's sort of the maximum length of an APL expression that I would recommend. If it gets much longer than that, you can't read it from left to right. So APL executes from right to left, but you should be able to read a good APL expression from left to right um, as it's being done here. If you can't do that, you should probably rephrase it so that it becomes easier to understand. Okay, so the syntax of APL, or the syntaxes of APL are very, very simple. There are really only these cases which are here. There's an array, which is, could be just a list of numbers juxtaposed. So this is a three element vector. Or you have a function followed by an argument. Or you have a function between infix. So functions are either prefix or infix. And then we have second order functions, which we call operators, which is a little bit confusing because you might use that for a function. But for us, operators are second order functions and they can either take a function on the left, so they associate with, uh, if they're monadic as we call them, which is another unfortunate term, they only take one parameter or one operand, it's on the left. So plus reduction is sort of the, the classical map reduce, which APL has had since 1966. Or an operator, this is the dot operator, it takes two operands. And this is the generalized vector product. So you multiply the elements element-wise, and then you do a plus reduction. Uh, and then we have this anomalous syntax for indexing, where you put, they have an array, square brackets. Uh, and so one of the things that's different about APL, I guess, or maybe Julia does this too, you can index by an array in Julia. Yes? Yeah. So there are other languages that implement that, but I think, again, APL pioneered it. So an important symbol that you'll see in a lot of the code is the lamp symbol. You may not recognize that a lamp, but that's because you're all too young. When APL was invented, lamps looked like this, at least in minds. Uh, so it illuminates the code, it's a lamp. And so here, let's have a look at what we call scalar functions. So the, the set of functions that take items pairwise, scalars at a time, we call scalar functions. So there's addition, 
And this is sort of really the signature expression in APL, that you just type vectors like that with no functions to compose them, put an infix function, and APL knows that obviously what you want to do is item-wise uh, addition. You don't have, you can have only one number or one element on one of the sides, and APL understands you, you want to reuse that number, so 25 is less than 30, but it's greater than these two, so you get 0, 0, 1. And for us, there's no, we don't distinguish between Booleans and, and we don't have truth values as separate. They are just one bit integers. So th that's stored as a bit array in APL. So we have functions like maximum, uh, multiplication. This time we are creating, this is the two by three reshape of iota six. So the, integ the integers from one to six reshaped into a two by three array and then all multiplied by 10. And even the random number generator accepts an array. So it takes an array argument, and for each element in the array, it generates a random uh, integer between one, or between the index origin. We have this business with index origin being selectable, zero or one. The default is one, because that's what most domain experts prefer. Uh, but of course, anybody who did real programming knows that zero is the only correct value. You can also give a zero here, and then you'll get a floating point value back between zero and one. Okay, so if you're curious about this, and you might do this already, um, there's a site called tryapl.org, which is an online REPL. And if you go to the, I think it's the primer tab, there's a cheat sheet where you can hover over all these symbols and you can see what they do. And you can type APL symbols. Uh, even if you don't have a keyboard, you can click on this uh, tab here and construct APL expressions. And okay, so now the rest of the talk is really a lot of uh, a long list of compositions, uh, functional composition forms that are are in APL um, that are all parallelizable to to some to some degree. So the, the one that I guess most of you are going to be familiar with is reduction. So in APL, if we have a matrix three by four reshape of iota 12, then the, uh, the times reduction of mat inserts a multiplication between all the elements of each row. So we get 24 for the first row and so on. If you put a bar through the slash, it's the reduction on the first dimension along the leading dimension. So we get the product. Um, and there's a form where if you have a multi-dimensional array, you can put square brackets after the slash to, to identify the dimension that you want reduced um, from the array. So the result is always an array with rank one less than the argument. There's a very similar function scan. You can scan uh, along the, the trailing dimension or the leading dimension, or any selected dimension. So the scan gives you the partial results as you move along the, the vectors. Okay. The outer product, that's the combination. So that's the application of the function to all items from the left and right argument. So if we had one and two on the left, 10, 100, 1,000, then we'll get, oh, the font color isn't very good there, but you see it's one times 10, one times 100, one times 1,000, and then, yeah, so we get an array which has the catenation of the shapes of the two arguments. We have a two-dimensional, two-dimensional, you'll get a four-dimensional result. Um, it's all very predictable. Yeah. Inner product, that's the dot with two functions, one on each side. So that's also, that's taking all combinations, but it's taking all combinations of, of rows from the left argument and columns from the right argument. You get a result then which has as many rows as the first argument and as many columns as the last argument. But rather than just implementing um, the classical vector or matrix product, Iverson recognized that this is a completely general construct. So it's the plus reduction, or it's the F reduction of G between these two vectors into the corresponding uh, position of the result. 
But it turns out that there are a whole bunch of other functions that are useful. Uh, for example, the combination of and and equals will tell you whether, uh, oh, it says any, it should say all. I think I switched from or to and in the middle of the night. So the and reduction will give you a one for this row versus that column, so the top right in the result telling you that these, this row is identical to that column. Um, and you could use or, or dot equals, you can, there are a number of functions that are useful to combine that way. So now a, uh, a brief uh, step into what we call mixed functions. So we looked at scalar functions, so they're the ones that just, just you know, take an item at a time. There are a bunch of functions typically to do structural operations on arrays where you, you don't want to operate on the individual items but the entire array in various combinations. And those are called mixed because the rules about how they take pieces out of the arguments are, well, mixed. You basically need to look each one up in the manual to understand how, how it applies. So rotations. We have the three by four reshape of IOTA 12, our good friend. If we do the two, zero, minus one, rotate with the, you can see, you can see from the vertical bar that the rotations are going this way, then it's moved this one, two to the, well, we can't see whether it's the left or right, it's a bad example. Uh, this one we can see that it's moved them, this one hasn't moved, that's corresponding to the zero, and this, the negative one has moved to the right by one position. So you can rotate all the rows different ways. And if you put the bar horizontally through the circle, then obviously you're rotating this way uh, and you're rotating the columns various amounts. We have functions called take and drop, uh, which are like head and tail in, in your classical functional languages, but they apply to the matrix. So the negative two, two take is the two take from the bottom corresponding to the negative two and the two and the one drop, you don't have to provide all as many elements in the left argument as you have dimensionality on the right. It will pad with what's suitable. So the one drop says drop, drop one row. And I mean, obviously, uh, you'll do that for all the columns, but we're not dropping any columns unless we, we extend that argument. Transpose, reverse the order of the dimensions. But there's a, a dyadic version of that where you can say, I want to do the one, one transpose or the one, three, two transpose where you explicitly reorder dimensions. And if you have a permutation, I mean, if you have something there which is not a permutation, so we have repeated here, one, one, what you're actually telling the interpreter or the language is that as it, when it's taken an item, it should, the order that it should increase the indices to pick the next item. And if you say one, one, that means pick increase on both dimensions so we get the diagonal. So we can extract the diagonal from a matrix with a, a one, one transpose. So we could extract a diagonal plane from a three-dimensional cube with a one, one, two transpose. Or a one, two, two, or a one, yeah, and so on, two, one, two. So index of, we saw the monadic version, that's the index generator, which just generates numbers from as many numbers as you put in the right argument, starting at the index origin. The dyadic version of that is a related function which looks the right argument up in the left argument. You saw maybe in the demo I did before the break, I was looking times up in a table of times to find the index. So one is in the second position, two is in the is not found, so that's seven, which is one more than the number of items in the list. Um, and three is in the first position. We have sorting, although Iverson decided that sorting was actually consisted of two parts, grading and sorting. So the grade, there's a grade up and a grade down. Grade tells you which order to pick the items in. And then if you have a little Func uh, anonymous function here which indexes the right argument by its own grade, then of course that sorts the numbers. And the reason for breaking it up this way is that um, Iverson realized that very often you have a keys in one array and you have data in another array, or you might have several arrays that need to be reordered in the same fashion. So it was useful to be able to split those two operations up, sort by something, and then reorder 
Uh, but of course, that's only useful in a language that supports array indexing and so on. So I guess maybe that's why you don't see that in, in other languages. So to summarize the, the basic parallel forms, we have all these scalar functions, including the circle function, which does trigonometrics. We have reductions and scans, outer product, inner product, and this base value that I used in the demo where I was interpreting the columns of a matrix in a, in a specified user-defined base. And then we have a bunch of mixed functions. We haven't looked at all of these. There's matrix inversion or matrix division. Um, and we've looked at most of the others. Okay, so then in 1982, <laughs> which is a while ago now, APL transition, there was a, a major extension of APL where we switched from having arrays which were strictly rectangular and all items of the same type to allowing any item of an array to be another array. So here we have a two element vector where the first item is a three element vector. And over here we have another two element vector where the first one is the simple integer vector and the next one is itself a two element vector with a seven and then eight and nine in the in, in the next item. And if when we do multiplication, we start at the top level and we do item wise. So we have two items at the top. So one, two, three is multiplied by four, five, six. And then 10 is multiplied by seven, eight, nine. And here we have only a single number and it pervades into the nested structure. So it's used all the way down. So the 10 here is used for the seven and for the eight and the nine. And so this, this was at the time where relational databases were coming out and you really had tuples of mixed data types uh, to work with. So APL was extended to, to cope with that. So we've seen that um, map is implicit in the scalar functions. If you want to use any of the mixed functions or you want to do something slightly out of the ordinary, you may need to explicitly use what we call each, which I guess you would call map in most uh, functional languages. So if we did the plus reduce of this, it's a two element vector. So the plus goes in between the two items and we get four, five, six plus seven, eight, nine. But if what we wanted to do was actually add up, do a sum of each of these vectors, we would say plus reduce each and then we would go down a level and apply the plus reduction to four, five, six and get 50, seven, eight, nine and, and get the next one. Um, a bit later, I guess this is significantly later, uh, Iverson and Huey working in, in J uh, came up with the uh, co constructs which are called function trains where you juxtapose two functions. So you don't get an array out of that, but if you juxtapose two functions without applying, without providing them with data, so you put parentheses around here, you get a construct where the FG is called an atop. So it's F atop and then G applied to the two arguments. Um, this is useful in a number of situations. I mean, one is just, this is really mostly a performance trick, if you like. If you say, I want to do deal atop of reshape, the interpreter can realize that that just means you need 10,000 random numbers between one and six. Whereas if you did the deal of the 10,000 reshape of six, the interpreter would first construct a 10,000 element array of sixes, which is an expensive thing to do. And then without knowing that they were all the same, it would go and look at each one and generate roll dice 10,000 times. Whereas here it can really optimize both the use of the underlying random number generator and not create the arrays and so on. And then there's a, a form with three functions next to each other, that's called a fork. So the monadic example, F G H of omega is F of omega G H of omega. So if the middle function were plus, for example, this would be, this is actually identical to the meaning in mathematical notation. If you say F plus H, that means F of X plus G of X. And that means that the, the mean, the average can be expressed as a three element train of the sum, divide, and count, or tally as we call it, because the mean is the sum divided by the count. 
And of course, the, this allows the interpreter to, to really optimize things because the, the parsing of something like this and the recognition in the AST that there's an averaging going on here can save the interpreter a lot of work. And there's even a little funny, if you use comma as the middle one, so you can sort of catenate functions together, that's not what's happening here. What this means is 1 plus 0.1 catenated with 1 minus 0.1, but it reads as you know catenating the functions together. So this expression, which was used in that uh, quadratic equation at the beginning, means 1 plus or minus uh, 0.1. Right, and of course, when you're looking at parallelism, you could go off and parallelize. If, if, it's, if they are functional, you could run the times in parallel and so on. So the interpreter has an opportunity to do some parallelization. We've seen a few of these anonymous functions so far. Of course, you can name them. Um, User-defined functions follow exactly the same convention as the primitives. So they can be prefix or infix, and you can have user-defined operators which are also prefix or infix, uh, following exactly the same rules as the primitives. And the huge advantage of that, of course, is that you can apply them with all of the operators because they all understand functions that are either prefix or infix. So sometimes you'll say, well, it's a bit of a weakness that APL can't have parenthesized arguments with seven items. But the cost of that would be that the application to many of these operators would, would be lost. And so far, at least, we've decided to, to shy away from that. So here's a Fibonacci where you're passing a two-element vector down. This is a recursive call. The right argument is how far you have left to go. So you decrement by one. And then you pass down to the next level. You drop the first item, and you take the sum of the elements and push it down. This is a guard which says if you get to zero, then you just return the first item of the and APL supports tail recursion, so it recognizes that's a tail recursion and doesn't start to build up a stack. Okay, so the power operator, uh, I'm a little bit behind, so I'll be very quick now. So that allows a function to be applied a number of times. So plus to the power of three, adds two three times to three, giving nine. You can bind one of the operands and give a, get a monadic operator called twice, so you could say plus twice. The right operand can be a function, in which case the function is be applied between the nth and the n minus one result, and when it returns true, you stop. So one plus reciprocal of omega, power limit, we would call this, gives you the uh, golden ratio, and it's parallelizable for certain functions. Um, so par parallelism of these basic primitives, um, we, we implement that in the interpreter, so if the machine has multiple cores, I'm comparing here uh, cases of addition, division, logarithm, and uh, or is extended to be out of the Boolean domain to be uh, greatest common divisor on, on numbers. And we can see that on, on my laptop, which is an i7, we get no speed up for plus because it's just memory bound. If you set all the cores to doing pluses, you get no speed up. And then as the complexity of the operation increases, we get up to you know close to a four times speed up here. Um, this is something where the hyperthreading actually manages to help. But typically, you will get no more than a factor of two on, on this parallelism. Um, right. So APL was extended into object-oriented applications because we wanted to do stuff like GUI. So here I'm saying create a form with a caption with pixel coordinates of a certain size. And then I can say but B1, B2, B3 is the F quad nu each of, and then here's one of these lambda functions where I vary the button uh, caption and the position. I pass in one, two, three, and I get three buttons. And then I can do things like this where at each level of applying the dot, if I get an array, then the next item in this uh, expression applies to all the items. So f dot b1, b2, b3 is an array of three buttons. And then I ask for the caption and the position for each one of the buttons. So I get a three element array of two element arrays with the caption and button. And if I say, set the position element one to 50, I can ex I'm executing this expression now inside the context of the array that I've created over there. 
and I move all the buttons at once. So you can apply, apply. Uh, I mean, this, this is a little bit of a party trick, but this kind of thing does actually happen in practice. You may want to re re reorder several items at once. And you can also, you have similar things if you're interacting with a com object model or a .NET uh, 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 object model. So here, you, many of you may be familiar with, this, uh, this is starting Excel as an OLE client. Open a workbook, get out the sheets collection and turn it into an array because APL is very imperative and eager and doesn't really like uh, lazy uh, constructs. So I get a three element array. I can refer to the names. Uh, so here's the spreadsheet in question. It has three tabs. And I can even say sheets.usedrange.value2. So we're going two levels down. And that expression extracts, in fact, all of the data out of an Excel, Excel spreadsheet, no matter how many tabs um, it has, if you find that's useful. Now, um, so we've seen that in Dialog APL, this uh, evaluates an expression in the context of each object. And when we needed a sort of a way to specify uh, asynchronous programming, we decided that a nice way to do that would be to define a form of namespace, as we call these things, where if you do an execution inside that space, it's actually running in a separate process. It will immediately return a future to you, which so you, your array is immediately fully populated with items. And you can do, um, you can do structural operations that take, drop, reshape, transpose on that without blocking. But then when you get to a primitive that actually needs to know the value of each specific item, the interpretable block, if that item hasn't been manufactured yet by the asynchronous call. So it allows um, subject matter experts to quite easily do asynchronous programming without getting into semaphores or message passing or, or, or things that they will find very complicated. So here I've created three empty isolates and then inside each one, I've just done a delay for four seconds. So I immediately get back a three element array. We can see that I called, I asked for the time here and it was zero, milli, zero seconds here, a tiny delay to get to here. This happened immediately. But then when I summed the array of the delays, the interpreter needed the values. So there, um, well, the sum of the delays is 12 seconds because they each delayed for four seconds and returned the amount of time they delayed, but the amount of time that passed was actually only four seconds. So we delayed for 12 seconds in a mere four seconds, which is pretty neat. Um, and then creating the isolates is sometimes, that's, that's useful if you want to have, maybe maintain some state in them, have some long-lived uh, global data out there but there's also a parallel operator. So if you had an expression like this, which uh, computes the, this just counts the co-primes below N by computing the GCD and seeing how many ones there are. And if you had an expression like that, an APL programmer can just insert the parallel operator anywhere, apply it to a function, anywhere he thinks it might be safe and worthwhile to parallelize it. And from a mathematical perspective, I mean, to us it's very important that APL retains its, uh, you know, the fact that it's a mathematical notation. You can disregard the parallels in there if the functions are, uh, are pure. So we get deterministic parallelism. Right, so Dialog APL in re recently has picked up a bunch of the work that was done in Sharp APL and J with some more uh, operators. One of the most uh, important ones, perhaps, is the rank operator, which is a generalization of the, the scalar functions, to, which allows you to specify exactly how you want to pick up items from the right and left. So if we say multiplication rank one zero, that says take rank one subarrays from the left and combine them with rank zero arrays from the right. So we can have a two by three matrix and a two element vector, and we can say, well, we're gonna start by looking at this vector and that scalar and produce this part of the result, and then we're going to move down to the next vector on the left and the next scalar on the right. So it's like sort of each left, each right, all, all boiled into one with extensions to any number of, uh, of dimensions. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip this example because we're running out of time. 
type, ah, actually, no, this, this, uh, this is too, too important to be skipped. So the combination of rank and the way the operators apply along dimensions allows us to, this is our average computation from before. So plus reduce along the first dimension divided by the number of items, which is also the count on the first dimension. So here we have a three dimensional array, the two by two by four reshape of iota six. If we just say, if we just apply the function as it is, it's going to go, oops, um, it's going to go along the leading dimension. So it's going to go down, add the planes together. So one plus nine is uh, divided by two is five. If we say we want to do the average rank two, it's going to apply the function to two dimensional subarrays. So it's going to take these numbers and average them producing that. And then finally, if we say, well, average rank one, it's going to apply that to the vectors here, and we average the rows. So the same average expression can be directed along a selected dimension using the rank operator. Uh, right, okay, we extended uh, IOTA to higher rank, so you can look up a row in a matrix. Um, and then another one which is important enough to spend time on it, even if we're running out, is the key operator. So the key operator is, is similar to rank in that it applies your function to selected subarrays. The difference here is that the subarrays are the items from the right argument, so the value here, grouped by the distinct keys. So here we have red and blue. The first, fun so the function here is alpha omega, which just says take the keys, which are provided as the left argument to the function, and the data, which is provided as the right argument to your function, and just return those as a two tuple. So the first call to the function is with the key of red and the values of 10, 30, 40, and the second call is with 20 and 50. So it's very similar to an SQL group by uh, operation, but as a, as a functional construct in the language. So if we just wanted to count them, we could say the key concatenates the count of the number of items, and that'll tell us we have three reds and three blues. And of course, Roger, who implemented this, doesn't go and call this user-defined function because there are a number of patterns. Both of these are patterns that occur very frequently in applications. He recognizes the idiom, and he goes off and says, well, that's just a uh, frequency count, and bang, you're done in faster than. There's no time for coffee when you're using APL. It's one of the. Um, and now, so it's a 50-year-old language. We just celebrated. We had a big party earlier this week in Glasgow where we celebrated the 50th anniversary, but we're not done yet. So here's a proposed operator design that we're still working on. It might be in version 16 of Dialog APL next year. It might take us a bit longer to agree on the design. So um, here's the identity function. That's not very interesting, but I need it to show how uh, stencil works because I'm saying identity function stencil three on a three element vector. And what that does is it applies your function to a moving window where each of the items in the array has the opportunity to be the center item. And this is the window size. So if you say three, that means you get one item on each side. So one needs something on the left side and three needs something on the right side and we just pad that with the, the numeric uh, fill elements. So we, the result here, this is the first invocation of the identity function, this is the second, this is the third, and we see each item in the middle. And uh, So this is just to show what the window is being called on. So if you wanted to do a classical blur stencil operation, you might say uh, a quarter, a half, a quarter, vector product with the data in the window, stencil three, and that'll apply this stencil. But this is a one-dimensional example. Uh, yeah, it's padded that with a zero on the left, and we get that number, and then so each one of these numbers corresponds to an item of the array being the middle of the, of the stencil operator. So you may have, you know, if you've looked APL up on the internet at all, you will have seen this expression, which is a little bit horrible because there's two 
outer product rotates being done. And these two rotates, first on the horizontal and vertical, are just trying to do that stencil operation to give you the data which is around each point. Uh, and then this logic here, the one and the value of the cell, or dot and with three and four, implements the rule. Now with stencil, we're gonna be able to make life even shorter in APR because we can just say plus reduce ravel omega stencil 3 3 on the array representing the board. Um, and if you think about that a little bit longer, oops, only three minutes to go, um, you can implement, you can recognize that in fact life is also a more general uh, stencil operation. If you define edges to weight the neighbors with a value of two and the center is one, then you can say, well, if you, you, if you do a weighted plus dot times on the window, then if the result is five, six, or seven, then you have, uh, you're going to continue, that's good. So you can build this array, which is also a very common technique in APL. You generate all the possible outcomes, and then you just say, well, life is good indexed by the plus reduction of the weighted multiplication uh, on a 3-3 tile. And, and we can get that to run fast, both in, on a single CPU and also on a GPU, we think. And I have an example of neural networks. How many people here working on neural networks? You look the slides up. Uh, so you can, you know, you can apply uh, sigmoid uh, weighting of neurons to a moving window and so on quite easily with this. Uh, we have models of this, so you don't have to wait for it to make it into the interpreter. And <clears throat> with two minutes to go, Yeah, so we, we, the indexing is, is non-functional at the moment, right? The square brackets are really a very side effect oriented way of, of specifying things. We are working on a new operator called at, where you could say 42 at two, one, two, three, four, five, and you'd get 42 in the second element, or two multiplied at one and five, or star at, and then you can have a function on the right which needs to return a Boolean, uh, it needs to be a logical function and you, so this says star for vowels, apple. And then you can even do crazy things like this. If you have a function that tells you whether a number is prime or not, you could say star, star at where not prime, 10 by 10 reshape away at 100, and see how the primes are scattered. Um, I'm out of time, so I'm, I'm really just gonna skip to the, to the last slide here. The main point I'm trying to make is that, um, you know, APL, we think allows subject matter experts to participate directly in coding. So they don't have to tell you a story that you go and code and you make a DSL for them. They can write their own DSL in this language. And if time to market is important to you, you can do that at least for the prototype and then if it performs like a dog, you can always you know, go in and help them uh, speed it up. Um, the futures and isolates allow the users pretty direct control over parallelization, which you know, we're working on trying to automate parallelization, but that's like the holy grail. People have been working on that for 50 years. Um, in APL, it's much easier to detect parallelism. Most of the people working on parallelism today have these super clever uh, compilers that detect loops in C code and parallelize them. Whereas here, you can start at a much higher level. Um, and then you can do all the clever uh, compiler things as well. If you thought that was interesting, go to Try APL. There's a full day APL workshop here tomorrow. Roger and I will be introducing APL and give you time to play with it. Or uh, go to one of these web pages. And I don't know, is, there, is the next speaker ready to come up or do I have time for a question while? Okay, while he sets up. So as long as I'm actively removing myself, I have time for a question or, or two maybe. Yes, do we have a microphone? And then at the back. Yep. Why use APL? Yeah. Yep. Yes. 
Well, I mean, that's, that's still true, right? Um, mathematics, so I, maybe I didn't understand the question. Yeah. Yep. We feel that we have, yeah. I mean, we have a language with no precedence rules where you can look at a, you can look at a line of code and with two days of training, you can learn how to take it apart and to see the other. You can decompose it. You can apply the kind of rules that Debashish and, and others have talked about. Uh, uh, you, know, you have all the functional qualities uh, that have been discussed. You have, in fact, something which I would argue is much closer to algebra and much more easy to reason about in that fashion than Haskell or Erlang. I mean, they have all the properties, but the notation doesn't help you as a tool of thought. To, to do the algebraic manipulation. And yeah, I think Roger will, I mean, we'll have more time for questions maybe in Roger's session, because he's going to be talking about APL, we'll steal some of his time. Naresh, can I ask you to manage the time here and uh, <laughs> decide how many more questions to, to allow? Oh, right, we have a coffee, we have a break now. Oh, there's a 15-minute lull. Oh, okay. So there's lots of time. Uh, yes. Yeah. Is that hosting my answer? So all the existing operators, they are very special with uh, some special protocols. So is there, uh, is there any, uh, uh, any point in time uh, when you feel that if there's a problem, when you feel that this difference is not you have to go to APL and then modify it so that you can solve this problem. Has anything like that happened before? Or? Well, I mean, I, I like to joke that APL is a, is a general purpose DSL, which of course is meaningless. But if I qualify that, it's a, it's a DSL for any problem which can be described easily in arrays. And then I'll claim that ev everything can be done with arrays. But of course, that's not true. You have trees, you know, you have problems which really legitimately require tree structures and lots of recursion and so on. And certainly APL interpreters are not a great tool for that because the, the cost, you're dealing with very, very small arrays and the cost of using an interpreter, it, it may still be a very good tool of thought for that. I think Roger has some examples which really show that it helps you think about the problem, but there you might want to rewrite in, in in a scalar compiled language to get the yes, performance, yes. if you need to do a lot of tree, tree traversal. So, so there are, there are, you can do it in APL, but it doesn't give you the benefits that I've been trying to sell to you here. Um, one of the problems we have is that good idiomatic APL is type invariant, rank invariant, shape invariant. So you can look at a function like that average function, and you have no idea whether it's going to be dealing on an empty array or 100 million floating point complex numbers. Yeah. So we, I mean, we're trying to do, we're slowly, the APL community is really quite isolated and doesn't spend anywhere near enough time at events like this, which is why it's so valuable for me to come here and, and talk to people. We're trying to get into the same kind of compiler, you know, just-in-time compilation, okay, this was called on a large floating point array, let's just-in-time compile that. But unfortunately, I think the, we, we allow the users so much power, which allows them to move very, very fast. So, but we're thinking of, you know, allowing optional type declarations in the language and so on. So when people get to a point where now it really needs to run fast. They can transition to a, a compiled, more static uh, environment. We do also have some users who want type declarations for the, for the uh, correctness aspect of it. Yeah, Sashi. Yeah. On, on floating point, numbers only. We decided only to do that. Um, the impact of that on real applications is, is typically quite small. Because, yeah. But uh, is the implementation using isolated users? Or <coughs> no. At, uh, for the parallelization of, of floating point operations, we are act the interpreter is directly using multiple threads. So that's very lightweight. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. We have a threshold where you can configure at what array size you want to. The at operator, yeah, I can't show it to you. Does it return a view or does it allocate a new array? Like if I say it. Right, so that's, that's one of the real tricks to having a high performance APL interpreter is that you need to try and recognize all the cases where the ref count to an array is one. Okay. So when you mute, you know, all the mutations are, I mean, we don't have mutable arrays, right? All the arrays are immutable. But of course, most, a lot of APL programmers are doing modeling where they have a 100 megabyte array and they you know, change one number in the middle of it. Uh, so we spend a lot of time uh, tracking ref counts and making sure that if the ref count is low, we can do all sorts of tricks. Well, we call it low, it means one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we haven't implemented at yet. That was also a model. Uh, and it's only going to be really valuable to our users if it can recognize uh, ref count one and do it in place. Otherwise, it gets too heavy. Okay. Yeah. It really depends on what you're doing. So if you write loopy APL code that runs around and handles one number at a time, it might be 100 or 1,000 times slower than C. Um, it's off, I think it's faster than Python. If you, have, if you use something like key, where we've written optimized cases. We have one byte integers, two byte integers, and four byte integers, and one bit booleans. And the interpreter, in fact, spends time trying to collapse data. So not only does it automatically promote data, it will actually, if it, when it does a garbage collection and at various other times, it will actively demote data. So if your floating point array goes to all zero, it'll become a bit boolean and consume 64 times less space. And that's, that has meant that people who have tried to write compilers for APL have really struggled to beat the performance of the interpreter. Uh, and also, handwritten C often won't compete with many APL applications because we've figured out that it's a one-byte integer, and you'd have to be pretty crazy in C to start coding special cases for all those data types. So, you know, we've been optimizing the interpreter for 35 years. So, good luck. <laughs> yes. Okay. Is that probably it? I collect all my stuff. Thank you.